On January 7, 1993, Ghana's fourth Republican constitution came into being. The transition from military to constitutional and democratic dispensation made provision for the establishment of a number of democratic and regulatory governance institutions. Among such newly established institutions was the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice. The story of the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice cannot be told without going back to the period when the Committee of Experts uh, who were uh, constituted to draft proposals to inform the 1992 Constitution and what they said in terms of what they expect this Commission to perform under the Constitution. I remember one instructive comment they made was that a catalog of human rights provisions in a Constitution will not guarantee the human rights of the people, of the citizens. But there's a need to have an instrument, a commission, that would enforce the fundamental rights of the people on the ground. And enforcement in this context would mean creating awareness of human rights, making sure that the, the rights of the people are protected, and to the extent of even ensuring that there is prosecution for rights that are violated. The 1992 Constitution has given charge a very broad mandate not only over human rights, but as a governance structure within the Constitution, covering human rights, covering corruption, covering good governance. And so the Consultative Assembly actually expanded the concept of what the Commission should be from the narrow confines that were expected by or recommended by the Committee of Experts. Then, of course, the Constitution came into being. Charge became uh, a body that was established by Parliament. And uh, Justice Samuel Short became the first commissioner or the founding commissioner of the Commission. When I was appointed Commissioner for Human Rights and Administrative Justice by the late President J.J. Rawlings. Together with my deputies, Madam Angelina Domachare and Mr. B.K. Opong, my first task as Commissioner was to find accommodation for the institution the then chief of staff, Nana Atu Dazi, agreed to let us have the old parliament house as our headquarters. You would all know that Shraj was a very novel innovation in the 1992 constitution. And so when the commission was set up, we were all involved in uncharted waters. As director of operations, I was in charge of investigations. I was in charge of research. I was in charge of uh, public education. And these rules were, again, very, very new. Shraj plays a critical role in the democratic governance of the country. This is because human rights is not just a Ghanaian matter. Human rights is a universal matter. It's of concern to the whole world. Shraj was deliberately enacted to give the people 
their rights to demand from the government and also the public sector generally, and as well even the private sector, uh, their entitlements as humans. This is the first constitutional order we have had that has lasted for getting close to 30 years. And I believe the structuring of the constitution and particularly the setting up of a number of governance structures like the Human Rights Commission is one of them. Firstly, it does that because justice has been brought very, very close to the doorsteps of many people in an informal way. Formally, if anybody had to address human rights issues, even the High Court was not an arena. You needed to go to the Supreme Court in most cases to get your human rights enforced. Now that you have a human rights commission that is decentralized down to the district level, it becomes easier for people to assess justice. The commission has received about 300 thousand complaints in the 30 years and we have resolved 90, no, 298 thousand that is a contribution that means that if the commission was not there these number of complaints that have been resolved would have been the basis of internal disputes among people and so as a governance institution we think we've done well in the area of complaints, investigation, and redress. In the area of legislation, that will take care of uh, traditional practices that are dehumanizing. We, have, we can count a number of successes. One, female gen genital mutilation. We've been able, through public education, to justify the need to stop that practice. Trocosi, the practice of uh, uh, female uh, servitude uh, in the particular areas of this country, we have been able to undertake very informed public education, pushed traditional authority to stop the practice and to have alternative life, livelihoods in place. And we have also had the practice criminalized about the witchcraft accusation. Because of the witch camps in the northern regions of this country, we have been able, through the efforts of others, finally had the bill passed. And I'm hoping that the president would assent to it soon. And that will be the basis for uh, sanctioning the practice of witch doctors and uh, witch hunters, and in fact, community members who label people and name people. You know, I started working in Shraja in 2002, I believe, from 2002 to 2011, I believe. And that was a very, very, um, for me, it was a very, very fruitful time. And I think I enjoyed it. Out of all my, the things that I've done, my career and, and so on and so forth, I think probably Shraja was the highest point for me. Uh, I learned a lot. And mainly I learned a lot about people. And I learned a lot about the meaning of life, what it is that we should be looking for. So Shrash for me, I'm very glad that I accepted uh, to be, to be um, uh, appointed in Shrash. Uh, to, be, t to tell you the truth, the first, first time when they asked me, I, I didn't want to. Because I didn't really know too much about Shrash at that point in time. When I was approached, at first I said no, then when I said yes, actually the former commissioner, uh, Commissioner Short had a lot to do with it, you know. Um, he, he actually managed to convince me, and I'm, I'm very grateful to him, because I came in with different, a different um, uh, mindset about Shraj. But uh, I think that uh, all in all, uh, he was a mentor, you know, and uh, I, I did learn a whole lot about Shraj. Now, what I want to say most, uh, um, the first thing that I want to say about Shraj is that uh, out of all the institutions, 
constitutional bodies, uh, I believe that that is the most important one because of its uh, mandate. And, and, and certainly because Shraj is looking at the welfare, it's really looking at the conditions of people. And that's very, very important. Anywhere I go, I say to people that if you put people at the center of whatever that you do, uh, not only would you do well for yourself, you'll have, you'll have a very satisfying, um, you, you, you'll be very satisfied with yourself, but you also do very well for people. again by the operations of the constitution is the government that makes the budgets to provide the resources for uh, the constituted organizations or institutions to operate and so for charge to be able to operate independently the government in its budgets should make the requisite uh, budget for uh, charge to, op to, to operate independent. It shouldn't go like cap in hand every two years. Otherwise, it would lose its independence. So my government respected the constitutional entitlement of uh, charge in terms of uh, giving it the budget that would um, enable it to function effectively as an independent agency of the Constitution to uphold the entitlements of the citizens in terms of human rights and also administrative justice. Charge has a threefold mandate, and within that, one of it is anti-corruption. Uh, this falls squarely within our mandate of fighting corruption and promoting good governance in the daily lives of the people. Our mission also seeks to ensure that we work together uh, with people, with institutions and partners to foster great partnerships to fight corruption. And so within that, uh, this is a very good marriage uh, of convenience uh, that we have had. So within one of Shraj's mandates, we find ourselves comfortably within. And we have worked on a lot of different uh, subjects, uh, beginning with public education. You know, Schneider also has a very big role when it comes to public education. So sensitizing people on corruption and also ensuring that people see corruption as a high risk and a low gain activity. We date back to 2004, when we did some program around assets declaration, because that is very critical for all of us, that public officers must declare their assets. So Amnesty International Ghana has been collaborating with Shraj for the past 30 years, since Shraj was established in Ghana. We've worked on so many um, issues together. We work on minority rights. We look at women's rights. Um, Amnesty also has a membership base all over Ghana. So what happens is when people report on human rights abuses, they come to us and we're able to refer those cases to Shraj, where Shraj gets, you know, lawyers or gets investigators to look into detail at the cases that are, you know, human rights abuses. We get all sorts of cases like in labor, labor laws, people having trouble with the law and people maybe experiencing torture. We also look at um, sexual and gender-based violence in schools. We run a public education program with Shraj that we're very proud of. There are a range of collaborations that the UN has had. Of course, some of the flagship areas include around the Universal Periodic Review and the role uh, Shraj has played in this particular area, uh, working on different areas of human rights, for example, on child rights with UNICEF, um, on broader uh, questions of rights around elections with uh, UNDP, the work of UNDP, on the rights of women and girls um, and children with uh, UNFPA and particularly adolescent girls. Um, so a whole raft uh, of areas that we've worked with Shraj, um, ensuring that Ghana is recommitting itself, 
not just to the Universal Declaration on, on Human Rights, but the various conventions that are out there, not just within the UN system, but also within the Africa-AU uh, system as well. So I think our engagement has been broad uh, and positive. The first case I did was a petition brought by the estate of a gentleman called B.K. Yemu, alias Kojo Sadim. A lot of his properties had been in, in, confiscated by the AFRC Judicial Tribunal. So we conducted that case and we concluded that he had acquired his properties lawfully, not through any illegal means. The properties were quite a lot. And so we ordered the deconfiscation of the properties and for all the properties to be returned to him. The other case of importance was in 1995, we investigated media allegations of corruption, illegal amassing of wealth by ministers and pub certain public officials. We did this investigation in the full glare of the public, even though one of the council objected and submitted that it should be done in private. But we decided that it was a matter of public interest. And therefore, we permitted radio and electronic media to cover the investigation. We made adverse findings against three of the ministers and um, we exonerated one person, the presidential advisor to J.J. Rawlings, for lack of sufficient evidence to substantiate the allegations. This was a decision that the government of the time was not happy about. And so they issued a white paper disagreeing with a number of our findings in response, we issued a rejoinder justifying our findings and conclusions. Eventually, the ministers resigned, which was a vindication of the commission's investigation. Well, the significant cases, I'll mention just two significant cases that, um, that uh, we did in Strash, not only because of the way we handled it, but also we also brought some very novel ways of handling uh, those, 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 um, those cases. Uh, one uh, significant one was, of course, uh, the one which we brought uh, with regards to the a sitting uh, head of state uh, at the time uh, that was um, uh, President Kufo. Um, and the, the question was whether uh, a sitting president could be investigated. Uh, and our answer was yes, he could be investigated, but uh, it, is, it is true that they have immunity also, but the immunity doesn't say that we should not investigate them. So that was one of the significant cases that we had, because if you re remember, uh, there was a lot of uproar about it. Uh, and I'm saying also that it was significant also in the way that we handled it. The second one was the one with uh, another one with Anani, uh, if you remember the Dr. Anani case as well. And here, one of the things that Trash did, which had not been done before, was to actually have video conferencing even at that time. Even at that time, we actually conducted the uh, hearing uh, uh, online. Uh, and that was really something that Shraj should be extremely proud of because even at that time, we managed to have this hearing 
online. So these are uh, two very significant cases that really brought us to the fore. The current priorities and initiatives of the Commission are as they are captured in the 2021-2025 strategic plan of the Commission. They span three or four broad objectives. One, we want to make the Commission the National Human Rights Institution with programs that cover almost all aspects of human rights. The initiatives we have started with are get a national action plan for Ghana on business and human rights. And the Commission is taking the lead with the Attorney General Department in getting that. Two, in the area of uh, detention facilities, people who, whose liberty is, is, is taken off, we have decided to push for the amendment of the Commission's Act to make the Commission designated as a national preventive mechanism. We have also pushed through other people and NGOs and um, members of parliament for the witchcraft accusation bill which has been passed and we're currently taking that through uh, sensitization of the particular regions which are affected. That is a major plus for gender violence and justice, access to justice. Then in the area of anti-corruption, uh, the, 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 the NACAP will be ending next two years. We've begun the process of evaluating the current NACAP in order to be able to have a more robust, more fit for purpose national anti-corruption action plan that would drive the fight against corruption even better than it has been done so far. In the area of the Ombudsman, the Ombudsman mandate, we have seen that it's important that service delivery, public service delivery is enhanced. And that can only be enhanced if we hold public officers more accountable for their decisions. It's common knowledge that corruption is too rampant. We have too much corruption in this country. And we need to be seen to do something. People come into office with the, the feeling that they are dead, they are, they've come, it's their right, having won elections, to do what they want. And that is something we need to stop. From the time I was appointed in 1993, to the time I retired in 2010, I stayed on the conditions of service of a court of appeal. And that also applied to the deputy commissioners. They stayed on the salary and conditions of service of a high court judge. And they could, because we were not part of the judiciary, we could not enjoy progression to the higher positions in the judiciary. The main challenge that we had, I think, uh, is a funding challenge, of course. You know, uh, the fact that in order to investigate human rights abuses, in order to investigate uh, corruption, uh, and uh, even to do the administrative justice, you do need quite a bit of funding because you need to be able to do research when you have to uh, even um, contact or even hire external consultants, you have to pay them. You know, so that was a uh, big, big challenge. Luckily for us, in a way, during that time, uh, because of the work that we were doing and because of the, um, I think, the, 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 the trust, and it's very important that um, uh, the populace trust you because if the populace trust this institution, they will actually fight for you. And I think we had, uh, at that time, the, 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 the populace really did um, trust us. Tried is handling 
or reaching out to the public through public education on human rights, uh, primarily in the past through community debates and physical discussions with members of the community. But we've realized that with time, with advancement in technology and ICT, we have begun to use social media to reach out. So you see a lot of social media, uh, you know, uh, posts going out from the commission on the areas that we think Ghanaians need to adapt. And of course, when we have the opportunity, we still use the tried and tested old practices of meeting the people and addressing public education on human rights that those people, that the particular community will, will require. My most memorable moment is when Shraj organized an international conference on corruption in 1995. Remember, Shraj was established in 1993. We published our first annual report in 1994. And whilst we were performing our duties and assessing how we are complying with the tasks that have been given to us, we realized that we hadn't done much in the corruption aspect. So we decided that we were going to sensitize Ghanaians on the evil effects of corruption. And when we mentioned it to some very highly placed and I must say well-meaning Ghanaians, many of them, I would say 90%, they just coughed. They said, what are you people about? We are going to talk about corruption. You can't do anything about it. So please, just enforce fundamental human rights and forget the corruption, because corruption is so endemic that nobody will listen to you. Everybody who came out of that conference became an ambassador against corruption. And they were so happy to know that correct, corruption is actually evil. So that's, that event always, whenever I think of it, I smile. Today, when you talk about corruption, everybody listens. They don't even wait for Shira to talk about it. Everybody is talking about it. And the more you talk about it, the more you expose it. One of the first memorable moments in the commission was when we actually launched for the first time uh, the uh, Human Rights Day. You know, we, we did that uh, and I think that was really memorable for us because uh, it then brought us even higher in the international, on the international, um, what you call it, uh, platform. And, uh, and when I saw the success that we had, uh, with setting uh, a human rights day. Uh, when I went to the African Development Bank, I set that one up too. And I said to them, we learned it from scratch. <laughs> My most memorable event was when I was invited to the Northwestern University for the award of an honorary doctorate degree in recognition of my leadership of Shraj. I also, of course, was awarded the national honors by the then President Kufu. I think it was entitled Order of the Volta. That also was in recognition of my leadership role in the commission. As the commission celebrates its 30 years, um, I would like them, I would like to see them strengthened in the area of human rights. I would also like them to see um, to have them publish a human rights report on Ghana. I think this is their mandate. I think this will be an excellent thing for them to do. And Amnesty International Ghana is always there to support in terms of research and investigation for those reports. Ghana just underwent um, its fourth universal periodic review and has just endorsed a, a range of recommendations this July. Um, it's quite timely in a sense and in fact, the launch of this uh, important uh, year for Shiraj at 30 
uh, coincided with Ghana making its presentation in Geneva at the Human Rights uh, Council. So clearly, over the next uh, four years, it's going to be extremely important that we accompany Ghana and its institutions, both within government and within civil society, and indeed increasingly the private sector. We want the people of Ghana to begin to appreciate, renounce, reject, or renounce, reject, report corruption. And we want to see a shrine which is almost in uh, the process of resolving our issues on a daily basis so that we don't have to fight about this. Corruption is a daily occurrence. And so shrine should be placed more strategically to fight corruption. And we want to see a shrine that is working more closely with other anti-corruption agencies coordinating their efforts, facilitating their logistics to ensure that we have effectiveness in the fight against corruption. Well, I, I guess that future is almost close at hand. Uh, we expect to see it play a more proactive role. We expect to see it diversify its activities and highlight on the little known human rights dimensions. We expect to see it coming out with a detailed annual human rights case report. Under our strategic plan, we, we realize that, look, charge must move out of the past. And so one major priority of the commission is using technology to leverage on the work on all the mandates of the commission. Now every staff of the commission will be working from a database. Database that is throughout the country. We are going to connect or the network the whole country, all the offices. When you are sitting here and you want to know what is happening in Zabzugu, the Zabzugu people who are working will be real and live on the database. So whatever they are doing in the performance of their duties, the whole world is watching. So they should look at this from this broader picture and do what is right and not be influenced by any unnecessary or untoward inducements. The main thing is that, that um, I think we'll stand, all of us, including uh, the current commissioners, the future commissioners in good stead, is one, getting the trust of the people. That's one. The people must trust you because they are the ones who are going to lift you up. And they are the ones who are going to fight for you. Uh, so you have to get the trust of the people. The trust of the people means that you have to be fair. You have to be impartial. You have to be neutral. I've always advocated that the anti-corruption portion of the mandate should be hived off and given to an independent anti-corruption commission so that it would make it easier for the commission to operate the two mandates of the Human Rights Commission and the administrative justice mandate, which is that of the Ombudsman. We wish the commissioner and his team the very best. We say are equal to you and more of the great exploits you continue to do. I wish the commission more laurels in its work and greater impact on the society. I'm so happy that I've been part of uh, the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, and I wish you the best uh, for many, many, many years to come. So I jointly say Ayeko to Ghana for all the work that Shiraj has done and also more grease to your elbows as you move forward over the next 30 years to really achieve outstanding results for Ghana. Good luck. The Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice 
is 30 years this year. We have walked the talk. Since 93, we have done quite a lot, commendably. I'd like to commend our previous leadership and staff and management. Right from Justice Emil Short, through Anna Bosman, and all the deputy commissioners who have worked in this commission. The management directors and staff who have been with the commission and are with the commission. As a sitting commissioner, I'm grateful and I appreciate what you've done. And I can only hope that the years that lie ahead of this commission will be years of better delivery, better support from government and from all our stakeholders, and your commission will continue to deliver even better on its constitutional mandate. I thank you for hearing us and for supporting us, and I hope you will continue to be with us on this long road ahead. Thank you. Thank you.